Hello, my name is Michael Hoffman from the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre in Melbourne, Australia, and I'm delighted to give this talk, PSMA Radio Ligand Therapy, Do We Need the Second Pet FDG for Patient Selection? Here are some of my disclosures. Only two years ago in Basel, at the last APCCC meeting, we had a vote. Which imaging do you recommend to select patients for lutetian PSMA? And most of you, after my talk, voted in favour of PSMA PET-CT plus FDG PET-CT, 60%. But as a lot has changed in two years since the APCCC meeting, we now have the phase three vision trial providing level one evidence. And those who voted in favour of just the PSMA PET scan are now proven correct because this study incorporated no FDG PET and showed improvements in patient survival and quality of life. So I could stop my talk right there, but FDG PET was not performed in the vision trial, so it actually doesn't inform on the value of this diagnostic test. And we learned over a hundred years ago that more is missed by not looking than not knowing. And I'm here to convince you today that FDG PET is very useful. In the Australian randomised trial, the first randomised trial of lutetium PSMA, we showed that it can perform favourably compared to carbazitaxel, and we performed FDG in all patients. The ANZUP therapy trial on the left had a PSA 50% response rate of 66% compared to only 46% in the phase three vision trial. We excluded 28%, whereas the vision trial excluded only 12%. So we have a 20% better response rate, and we excluded only 16% more patients more. So could it be that the patients we excluded in the therapy trial by using FDG PET didn't get much benefit and we just enriched the cohort for the patients who actually benefit for this treatment. This is a 66 year old man with metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer after docetaxel and enzalutamide and his PSMA PET shows multiple bony metastases with high intensity activity. On the PSMA PET scan alone, suitable for therapy using our quantitative SUV max criteria and clearly above liver, suitable for the vision trial. So on PSMA PET alone, suitable for both trials. But the therapy trial incorporated FDG PET. And look at that scan. More is missed by not looking than not knowing. We can colour code this for ease and we can see that the burden of FDG avid disease within bone is roughly double the PSMA avid disease. Here, nicely colour coded, and when we take a slice through the lumbar spine, we can see these bony metastases, FDG positive, completely PSMA negative, and completely occult on the CT scan. So we can see what we can target, and we can see what we can't target. And I would purport that this patient will not benefit from lutetian PSMA. And if another treatment option like carbazitaxel is available, that should most certainly be used in preference. What about this patient with node-only disease? Enlarged subcarinal node with intensity just above liver that we can see on the MIP scan, or by SUV criteria, seven compared to five in the liver. And this paraaortic node that we can see on the CT scan, but it's borderline enlarged and has no uptake, an SUV max of two. By the therapy trial, all sites of disease have low PSMA expression, and we don't reach our quantitative threshold for inclusion. On the vision trial, this patient just scrapes in the enlarged subcarinal node being above liver and the smaller retroperitoneal node considered non-measurable. The FDG PET adds a little, not as much as the last case. It allows us to visualize that these retroperitoneal nodes are highly FDG added, most definitely prostate cancer and most definitely significant. And I will tell you that these are the nodes that will grow most quickly, being the most FDG added. And if we can't target the most aggressive disease, we're going to result in small benefit or no benefit for this patient. Can knowing the true extent of disease really be better? Can not knowing the true extent of disease really be better for your patients? Let's consider this case. PSA may have a disease in bone above liver and above our quantitative therapy uh, threshold. But when we look at the FDG PET, again, we identify a number of invisible lesions, cannot be seen on CT, like this one in the cervical spine. And this patient was excluded from the therapy trial and therefore had off-trial carbazitaxel. But shortly after commencing that treatment, developed neck pain and cord compression. Now, without the knowledge of this FDG PET, 
you might just think, oh, that's a bit of degenerative neck pain. But knowing where the disease is may lead you to an early MRI or early external beam radiotherapy to prevent a critical complication, cord compression. So knowing the true extent of disease, even with all this clinical trial data, helps us manage individual patients to optimise their care. Now, lutetian PSMA is not magical. It works by delivering radiation to sites of tumours, much like external beam radiotherapy. We've shown from our PETAMAC phase two study of 50 patients that there is a direct relationship between the dose delivered to tumour, dosimetry, and response. In men who received less than 10 gray using quantitation of whole tumour dose, there were 10 non-responders and only one responder. So dose matters. If we don't get dose to tumour, patients will not respond. Well, does uptake on PSMA PET correlate with dose? And we also showed that this was the case. On the left, we can see the SUV mean on a PSMA PET scan and the dose to tumour from quantitative post-therapy spec CT imaging. And we can see a clear dose response relationship. We also looked at the value of FDG and PSMA PET as a prognostic biomarker. And we showed that if you had a large volume of FDG over disease, over 200 mLs, you had much worse overall survival, a hard endpoint. And if your PSMA SUV mean was over 10, so you had high PSMA expression, you did better because we could deliver more radiation to sites of tumour. So these need validation in larger studies, and we are currently undertaking this on the therapy study. This was also validated in a recent multi-centre effort, 270 patients from Peter Mac, UCLA, UCSF, and several centres in Germany. And we incorporated this tumour SUV mean criteria from the PSMA PET and showed that it could be used in a normogram to predict probability of PSA response, progression-free survival, and most importantly, overall survival. So dose matters. Disease or tumour heterogeneity is a critical limitation of current oncology methodology. When we do both PSMA and FDG PET, we see multiple disease phenotypes in the one patient. This is a phenomenon we need to better understand. But if we don't do the FDG PET, we can't see those aggressive sites of disease or the sites with highest proliferative activity, which are the ones we ought to biopsy to get the most information, or sometimes biopsying two sites, ones with opposite phenotypes. Only by incorporating FDG PET in our studies and collecting this data will we truly understand some of our biomarkers from next generation sequencing or microarrays. Lastly, I'd like to mention the value of post-therapy SPECT CT imaging, which was included in the therapy study. Not commonly, but in around one in 10 patients, we paused treatment because of a complete or near complete response on the post-therapy SPECT scan. Here we see a patient who was paused early after only two cycles of lutetian PSMA, achieving a 99% reduction in PSA and a complete response on PSMA PET. And this was durable for quite some time, actually almost a year. And then when we retreated the patient, we simply commenced cycle three, four. So we didn't waste all our cycles upfront. And we think this more personalized approach guided by imaging can be of value to optimize lutetian PSMA therapy. So in summary, with theranostics, you see what you treat. And don't forget that more is missed by not looking than not knowing. This has typically been applied to physical examination, but nowadays it's really important for imaging. PSMA PET intensity correlates with lutetian PSMA dose delivery, which correlates with outcomes. FDG PET enables us to see invisible disease that can't be seen on PSMA PET, CT or bone scan. And this is especially true within bone. FDG positive disease is clinically relevant. It's the disease with the highest proliferative rate, most likely to cause symptoms. As our evidence base is evolving, we must incorporate both C FDG and PSMA into clinical trials, just as we are doing in Australia. And just like we have done with two scans, CT and bone scan to date, only by generating the data that we can critically evaluate will we be able to define the best path for our patients. On behalf of the team right around Australia that has been pivotal in this work, I'd like to thank you and a special shout out to the team at Peter Mac, the multidisciplinary team 
from nuclear medicine, urology, medical oncology, and radiation oncology, our funding partners and our collaborative partners. Goodbye from the Peter Mac in Melbourne. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. That was just a little bit above 10.